Welcome to our noontime webinar. I'm Dr. Jill Brooks, Director of Education at First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we offer a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business, be it a hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. For these monthly webinars, we bring experts in from around the country to cover a variety of compliance topics. Today's webinar, titled Maintaining Effective Compliance Under the ACA's Evolving Reimbursement Rules, is presented by Kenya Woodruff and Sean McKenna from Haynes & Boone. Kenya Woodruff is a partner at Haynes & Boone and co-chair of the Healthcare Practice Group. She provides advice to health systems, hospitals, accountable care organizations, ambulatory surgery centers, physician groups, diagnostic imaging centers, and pharmacies on regulatory and transactional matters. She has more than 15 years of experience in the healthcare industry, having previously served as a compliance officer and a privacy officer of a nationally publicly traded radiology services company and as deputy general counsel at Parkland Health and Hospital Systems. Sean McKenna is also co-chair of the healthcare practice group, as well as a partner in the firm's government enforcement and investigations group. Sean offers clients over 17 years of healthcare litigation and fraud enforcement experience most of which was honed during his years in an assistant U.S. attorney and the Office of the Inspector General and General Counsel for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Drawing on this wealth of experience, Sean regularly represents individuals and providers under civil and administrative investigation by the Department of Justice, Office of the Inspector General, and Attorneys General Medicaid Fraud Control Units, and in criminal matters conducted by the United States and State Attorneys General. Sean is also commonly called upon to re represent providers before Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial contractors. Sean, Kenya? Good morning, how are you? Good morning, everybody. We are going to talk today about maintaining effective compliance under the ACA's evolving reimbursement rules. Uh, we will talk about accountable care organizations, some of the different payment models, uh, as well as just the implications on the market. To give you some indication of how Sean and I interact on a regular basis, um, I typically help providers who are trying to come up with different types of arrangements to really facilitate, protect, facilitate proactive uh, arrangements within this new environment that we're in. As many of you are aware, and I'm sure are experiencing in your market, you have not only the reimbursement aspects of what's going on from a private pay and government pay or situation, but also you have the reaction in the market of providers coming together in ways that they have not in the past. You see large hospital systems that have traditionally been competitors coming together in joint ventures or even uh, mergers and, and acquisitions. You see physicians and payors now with differing relationships. They've traditionally been on opposite sides of the table um, in a very sometimes acrimonious uh, posture, but now they are coming together and finding ways that they can deal with the new financial realities. So that's the backdrop of where I'm coming from. And when people are trying to figure out, well, what if we have this relationship or this financial arrangement? Um, I will then go to Sean and say, well, Sean, you know, what did you do when you were at the Department of Justice? What would you think about this? Give me, give me your smell test on this. So whenever you are looking at, and I'm sure the compliance professionals and legal professionals on the line will attest to this, whenever you're looking at something that makes clinical and financial sense, you also have to make sure that it is legally compliant because in the industry that we're in, uh, they're not always aligned. Uh, so again, the topics that we're going to discuss, the payment and service delivery models, we'll talk about some of the federal laws that are involved, and then the tools and techniques for compliance. Uh, there are some tried and true things that you do within a compliance arena that you may have to just tweak a little bit or really hone to make sure that it is uh, effective for these new models. Some of the categories of innovation models are accountable care organizations, 
the episode-based payment initiatives, and we know those have been coming around for the last several years, primary care transformation, initiatives focused on the Medicaid and CHIP population, uh, initiatives by the Medicare, Medicaid uh, dual eligible, initiatives to accelerate the development and testing of new payment and service delivery models. We see a lot of areas now and some funding from the federal government that is going towards supporting uh, people who have ideas. And I think they have heard the complaints over the years that some of the innovative models that really could result in increased clinical and better clinical care at lower cost has been impeded by either antitrust rules or uh, stark rules in particular that are so stringent that they don't allow for the financial model to follow a good clinical and quality of care model. So in response to that, we see the government saying, okay, well, we'll waive some of those rules under the ACOs, or we'll give you this uh, small area where you can have a testing ground to see what can you do if we give you some relief from the rules that you're claiming are uh, restrictive. And we are really seeing that the market is responding in a really interesting way, uh, coming up with solutions in, in many areas. And even if the ideas that they come up with don't work, they really are finding new ideas and they can be the basis for other things that are to come. Yeah, one thing to consider also, and then I wholeheartedly agree with what Jeannie's talking about, the response from the marketplace. Unfortunately, the response from a lot of the regulators and even law enforcement is somewhat skeptical as some of these arrangements are becoming more commonplace. And I really think from an enforcement perspective, when you're trying to create these transactions, or to determine what is compliant, which pre presents less risk. Just because the Fed say, okay, you can waive these particular rules or we'll take a kid's glove approach uh, as enforcement, you really have to be careful to make sure that you are actually being compliant with the rules, however, of a lower threshold they are. Because I have seen clients decide, okay, well, this is an opportunity for us to kind of reimburse physicians for their referrals, knowing that there are certain waivers in place, and, and I've had clients that you know have run afoul of some of the enforcement rules because they took a very laissez-faire approach to that. So just because it's all everything new is under the sun, once again under the Affordable Care Act, doesn't mean that there are not risks associated with those types of transactions. Oh, absolutely. And you know, whenever I'm sitting down with a client and trying to figure out, well, is this something really we should do? The first thing I say is, look you are going to have to answer to what the outcomes of this arrangement are. So if you are technically in compliant with the rules, and we'll talk about some of the specifics in a moment, but the outcome is that you have increased utilization because of the arrangement that you've put in place, well, you're going to have a really hard time um, explaining those additional, maybe the financial remuneration to um, physicians or some of the arrangements that you have with ancillary providers like labs and pharmacies, it's going to be hard to explain those if you really haven't produced the results of increased care and more efficiency. So talk a little bit about ACOs. Uh, I usually consider these in uh, a group of types of arrangements of ACOs and collaborative models. What I am seeing is that physicians, hospitals, other ancillary providers are coming together in different ways and utilizing the Medicare Shared Savings Program ACL rules to, as a basis to have a framework to come together and to also take advantage of some of the benefits of being an MSSB ACO. But beyond that, they're seeing that just organizing as an MSSB ACO isn't enough. They're really having to use those relationships to leverage into other collaborative care models such that they can create the savings that's expected and they can have a sustainable business model. And you've heard so many stories about a number of the ACOs failing and 
not uh, really resulting in the outcomes that was hoped by some of the founders of those ACOs. On the flip side, you also see ACOs that have been successful. And I believe when you look at those, you'll see that the ACOs that have been successful have not only looked at mere strict compliance with the ACO rules and regs that are set forth, but they've also taken a much broader look at the economic realities within which that entity exists. And um, all healthcare is local. It depends on, you know, not only the state, but that particular region of the state. You know, what's going on with the providers? What's going on with the patient population? If there's not a sound business model behind the ACO, it's going to struggle. And that business model may entail a number of other uh, collaborative relationships or preferred provider relationships, others that can ensure that the full suite of services um, is available to the ACO and they have the proper technical and administrative support. Uh, generally, ACOs are entities that contract with a payor for MSSP or Medicare Shared Savings Program. They contract with CMS, and under that arrangement, um, a certain benchmark is set for uh, the spending uh, for the care for the patients that are attributed to the ACO. And then if there are savings and the patients are kept well, but there's a savings, a delta between the benchmark and what's actually spent, then that savings will be split between the ACO and CMS. And, and Kenya, one of the models that we're also seeing <clears throat> that we've discussed previously are some on the commercial side where obviously we'll talk a little bit more about that. There's no federal waivers for some of those types of arrangements, but are you seeing a lot of movement on the commercial payer side rather than just the Medicare? Yes, I mean, they are seeing from the MSSP ACO and Pioneer ACO that many entities are really not prepared to go to full risk where they are uh, both uh, responsible for the upside and downside. So a benchmark is set and the amount spent to take care of the patients is under that benchmark. You split the savings. Okay, you know, that's the one-sided model. But if I think we have that here, but the two-sided model where the ACO is responsible for any amounts that are spent over the benchmark, many in the MSSP and ACO models were not prepared for that. And so when the private payors are looking to have some kind of shared risk, they are starting in the one-sided model with just incentives because not everyone is ready to go full risk. There are some hospitals that are more integrated and more in tune with their patient population, and they are beginning to step out into that risk area. Everyone is aware that that's where we're going, and that's why you see the relationships forming that you do, that people are coming together and saying, okay, we have this patient population, what is gonna happen not only from an acute care uh, inpatient perspective, but also post-acute, uh, we're pulling in house calls and skilled nursing facilities and home health and having either an ownership relationship between the hospitals and those entities or a collaborative model or a joint venture or something that pulls them closer together. Who are the big commercial payers that are in the space right now? that are doing these types of arrangements? Really, everyone is. I mean, you see, uh, I've seen some with Cigna, some with um, United, some with uh, Humana. It depends on the particular relationship that a provider has with that payor and the what happens at the negotiation table when okay. they're getting their plan in place. When they come into the relationship, they will often have a certain a certain amount of agreed upon rates, and then there will be an addendum for uh, potential shared savings or potential incentives. And when you 
Uh, see, when you look at the ACO structure, the ACO is a single legal entity, and that single, single legal entity will come with CMS, but it's um, almost an aggregator of different physicians and other providers. So that ACO has participants. Those participants are at the tax identification number level. So in the example of a physician group, a physician group would be the tax identification uh, number entity, and then the individual physicians in that would be the providers or suppliers. Okay. And that's a very general overview. We already talked about the one-sided and two-sided models. Again, under the MSSP, the first three years are one-sided model, and there's been some discussion about increasing that to um, to another three years because there's been an acknowledgement that you really, depending on the extent to which the physicians and the other participants in the ACO have worked together before forming the entity, some of that will dictate how long it takes to really reach the integration necessary to result in some savings. And since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, I mean, what's the timeline you're seeing on some of the more sophisticated models to really reach that peak, or not maybe peak, uh, savings on an, under an MSSP? It depends on how specific the plan is at the beginning. I have seen some hospital-based ACOs that have a uh, friendly physician model or employed physicians, and they have struggled with creating savings. Um, some have felt that that's because those hospital systems had already drilled down on so much of the cost savings that they, they have squeezed everything out already. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen some independent physician models where doctors didn't know each other, they came together, in year one they saved $10 million because they had an IT partner that gave the doctors real-time data, or as real-time as it could be, there's usually a lag with the information that they get from CMS, 30-60 um, day lag. So, but they had that data as soon as it was available about the particular patients assigned to them. So they were able to dictate how the communications went forth, where they allocated their resources, if they had care coordinators, well, we're going to target these care coordinators um, at the top 10 to 15 percent of utilizers in the entity and figure out what's going on. Why has that person hit the emergency room three times already this year? Uh, we look at the hospital ACO structure, and I'll give you a, this is a really high level overview of the hospital ACO structure and an independent physician ACO structure. The hospital ACO structure is really hospital centric. The ACO owns or is owned entirely by the hospital. So the hospital is the control entity there. Uh, from CMS's perspective, when you have the relationship between Medicare and the ACO, they have specifically said in their guidance, look, we are not trying to dictate the ownership of the entity. We're not trying to dictate um, how you run as a corporation. We are asking you providers to come together and find a way that works. Um, there are certain rules about the control aspects that physicians have to have, the 75% control, and that has to be adhered to. But uh, beyond that, they have very specific guidance saying, look, we want you guys to come to us with structures, with ideas. So for hospitals, many of them said, you know, we will set up an ACO. We already have a certain number of contracted physicians. They're either employed or independent contractors, and we will look to them to be the participants in the ACO. Then when CMS gets that list where the ACO says, these are the physicians that are affiliated with our ACO, they then look and see how many of those um, physicians have seen Medicare patients, and for those that have been, has seen those particular providers 
for more than 50% of their primary care in the last three years, those individuals get assigned to those physicians. To qualify as an MSSP ACO, at least 5,000 Medicare beneficiaries have to be assigned to those individuals. Once Medicare sees that and the patient population has been defined, these are the ones that are assigned to this ACO by virtue of the relationship with those primary care providers. A benchmark is set based on those, uh, the historical utilization of those individuals and it begins. Uh, that year of performance is then assessed by CMS and they see whether the benchmark has been exceeded or whether they've come in under that and they've created a shared savings. The money then goes, that shared savings money, then goes from Medicare to ACO. That's the green line. Um, and then the ACO can determine who gets the money from either the hospital or the participating physician. Uh, though there are specific waivers for those payments, shared savings waivers that uh, allow those payments to be made. Kenya, on some of these pioneer ACOs, I mean, some of you read a lot about how some of them just kind of pulled out or just were not successful. Mm -hmm. Has there been any kind of published findings or just, you know, literature about you know, what the problems were with those types of organizations? Well, it's similar to any other clinical arrangement that you put together. Um, if you've been around and you've tried to put together providers with hospitals or hospitals with ancillary providers, some there are some people that are just not good providers or some that are not willing to give up the autonomy um, that's required to be in a collaborative model or an ACO structure. When we were, and I'll move to the independent physician structure, when we were trying to negotiate an ACO structure that included over 300 independent physicians who, well, we're in Texas, so we'll say fiercely independent physicians, um, it was very difficult. They were used to having uh, their own practices. They were used to controlling um, everything that happened. Uh, and the idea of coming together under one umbrella and coming up with a set of uh, proven clinical benchmarks that everyone agreed to was frankly scary for them. Okay. We got so many questions about, well, what does this mean for my autonomy as a clinician? Because in, in many of these instances, they were in rural or uh, not quite rural, but very much so suburban areas where they had really run their own show. Now, they had been running their own show without the benefit of clinical data. Mm -hmm. they, they hadn't been able to slice and dice this information in the past. They had been relying really on the relationships with patients, um, expecting those patients to continue to come back. And in some instances, seeing the patients, getting in as many people as they could, and hoping and praying that they got paid. I mean, not really knowing, well, maybe I should have been billing this a certain way, or maybe if I kept in contact with the patient in another way and maintained some kind of protocols, maybe this would really help. So really, in this particular um, independent physician structure that I'm thinking about right now, the third-party investor was an IT company. So they really gave those independent physicians the ability to figure out what was going on with the patient population that was assigned to them. What's the breakdown? I mean, how many HCOs are out there currently as we stand in 2015? About 400 and some. And what's the breakdown versus independent physician versus hospital-based or hospital -based? Most of them are physician-based. The vast majority, I think it's like 280 or so, are, are, are Physician base. Is that a surprise or? Uh, no, I mean, well, just by sheer numbers, there are many more physician groups than hospitals. So um, some of it is that. The other is physicians have the ability to access the primary care lives that are necessary to form an ACM. So when you are looking at the patients to be attributed in an MSSP ACO, for instance, they have to be primary care physicians, and not all hospitals have um, 
relationships, a significant number of relationships to enable them to get to that. Um, but you are seeing some of the independent physician ACOs and the hospital ACOs coming together and collaborating and really using best practices. What do you think the biggest compliance challenges are for the hospital-led versus the independent physician structure? Well, the hospitals traditionally have very strong compliance departments, or they at least have a compliance department. Um, they are very used to audits, routine audits. They're very used to um, a good deal of infrastructure. But for the independent physicians, they often have not had that type of infrastructure in place already. So it is uh, the level of reporting and information and rules, it, it's much more than they've had to deal with in their traditional independent practice. Um, the other piece is, and I alluded to it earlier, is with the independent ACO, they have to really be mindful of the business proposition behind what they're doing. Um, they're, and they may not be used to doing that. They are driven towards the actual provision of care and not really used to the same infrastructure building as hospital systems have been doing for decades. So when they're trying to build up the relationships, um, they don't necessarily have a full compliance department to really vet that. Um, and really, as you look at the next generation ACOs, and they're opening up even more ability to have relationships with home health and telehealth and skilled nursing facilities. As we know, the home health and skilled nursing facilities are some of the areas where you've had the, the most enforcement. Right. So, I mean, in, uh, in Texas and many counties here, we're still under a moratorium. We can't even get any more home health licenses here because of the uh, degree of fraud and abuse that's perceived, maybe actual, but perceived at least right. <laughs> by uh, the regulators. But home health and skilled nursing facilities are so key to really controlling the cost. So under the next gen ACOs, you have to balance that. Yes, you can use the waivers. Yes, you can look at some of these other things to pull those entities within the ACO, but we have to be careful with some of the medical director arrangements and some of the relationships that have traditionally been used to encourage fraud may also now be used to really bring those individuals in as preferred providers within the ACO. Uh, we have seen some situations where home health and hospice are invited either as actual parties and in, in the ACO entity or that they receive payments or percentages of the shared savings based on how much they can help save and how much they can help reduce the cost. Um, it has been really helpful to see home health professionals actually in the emergency rooms and in the hospitals waiting for discharge so that they're meeting that patient right there at discharge and can make sure that there's a continuum of care when they get home and that there's not a gap where that person may readmit to the hospital. And we know that that's a big issue with the, the readmissions and the payments that have, are having to be made. It seems like from a compliance perspective, it might be easier too because while there are marketing entities out there trying to get those types of discharges, having someone who's affiliated within the ACO or knows the system and knows kind of, I would say have a more than passing familiarity with the rules and, and requirements would be beneficial from at least maintaining any potential problems or medical necessity questions down the road. Right. Well, as, and we always talk about in compliance that um, there is always a a benefit to transparency. So what we're seeing is that if the ACO and the home health entity can have communication with the hospital, and sometimes it is difficult, it depends on the area, whether there is 
um, some kind of relationship or whether it's antagonistic or whether it's collaborative will dictate the extent to which the communications between those different levels of providers can really result in good quality continuum of care treatment for those patients. Uh, where we will say that I'll say that I see both sides. I see some that are contentious and some that are really, really, really work well. It does not help, let's say, an independent ACO, independent physician ACO, to monitor patients before they enter the hospital and after they enter the hospital, but have no idea what happened when they were in the hospital. Um, that that continuum of care piece is so so. Key. One of the one of the points there at the bottom of the slide, Kenya, is that we're talking about compensation for the physicians or for the ACOs for attainment of the goals and the quality savings. I mean, how are you advising your clients as to you know what is permissible versus what is not permissible mm -hmm. as far as you know the shared savings aspect to the ACOs or the collaborative models? Well, again. Everything comes down to the clinical model. It needs to have a clinical model that um, has at least some research behind it to, to say this is why we think this will work. Um, and it should make common sense. And I, I really think that if you start with something that does not make clinical sense, does not make common sense, it's very difficult to prove the legal piece. Um, and you remember that when I had to come before you when you were yeah. at DOJ. <laughs> Gene and I have a long relationship uh, for many, many years. So when I was at a hospital system, Sean was on the other side at the Department of Justice, and we had to have some talks. And, you know, it really comes down to, well, why did you do this? Why did this happen? What was the goal here? And if you can really establish that, I think that's going to be so key in the era when, um, there's more ACO enforcement. I think now the government is giving everyone a little leeway to see what they're going to do, but there will be a time where people have to account for what's going on. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I believe that the government right now, because frankly the ACA has been the signature piece for this administration, and so the last thing you want to do, and I think they want to do, is really muck up kind of how the in, in what's an enforcement agenda. Now, antitrust is slightly different, and I think there is going to be some antitrust concerns uh, along with the FTC and DOJ, but day-to-day -day enforcement out, you know, the routine types of healthcare cases, I think will be kind of, you know, until the parameters of the market are set for the next year or two and some maybe some more regulatory guidance, be it safe harbors or exceptions, et cetera, that are actually established for the next few years, I think you're going to have you know, more opportunities to be flexible, but I say within the next two or three years, I really believe that, you know, the contours will be established and the outliers will be taken, uh, at least have a hard look taken at them. And I think even, I, I was just a uh, panel with uh, some parties from the Federal Trade Commission and DOJ last week, and we talked about these antitrust issues. And it was really interesting to hear their perspective. I mean, yeah, from the council perspective, we are always hypersensitive to antitrust issues, and we definitely uh, never want our clients to be in a situation where they're in an enforcement uh, situation or enforcement action regarding antitrust. But they really said, look, we look. it's the rule of reason. We really look at are there true efficiencies, and if there is an impact on – the payer market. Are the payors going to be in a situation where they only have uh, one ACL or one party that they can that they can uh, contract with? If they are able to still have the ability to contract with those individuals and those individual hospitals separate and apart from the ACO, then that is given a great degree of deference. Um, if you have, and I know we've seen this in some of the airline cases and uh, some of the other things that have happened, if you have uh, specific communications, emails, letters, publications that talk about, yes, we're trying to lock this market up, yes, you know, the payers will only be able to come to, well, all of that is going to be uh, relevant. And I know it sounds silly, we've seen so many 
uh, email scandals, but uh, I still see some ill-advised emails and PowerPoint presentations out there. Uh, these are some of the payment models under NextGen. Again, you're, you're seeing you have the normal fee for service, you have population-based payments, but you know they're already you know, teasing that capitation issue where we know that at some point private and public payers are going to really be moving towards uh, capitation. Here's some of the uh, fraud and abuse laws, and we'll talk about those a, a little bit more as we move into the, the compliance piece. Um, you, you all are well aware of SAR, Candy Kickback, uh, the CMPs, and the fact that the ACO the ACOs have certain waivers regarding uh, the laws that are granted by CMS and OIG. And I think the real important issue is that you know, there are federal laws that, you know, commercial ACOs or collaborative models, you do not get the benefit of a waiver, but mm -hmm. there's also certain criminal laws that we'll talk about in a moment that really could implicate not only commercial, but just uh, Medicare ACOs as well. Right. And that's what we wanted to, to key on this slide for you is that the, the waivers, uh, there are no specific waivers for commercial ACOs. There can be benefits that the from commercial ACOs get as a result of uh, relationships that are MSSP based, but uh, there are no specific com waivers for commercial ACOs. And there are still the antitrust implications that we discussed. Uh, there are a number of waivers and uh, different accommodations that are made for Medicare Share Savings Program ACOs. The ones that I use most commonly are one, two, and three. The pre-participation waiver, the participation waiver, and the shared savings distribution waiver. Basically, the pre and pre-participation and participation waivers uh, require that the governing body, the single governing body of the ACO entity, determine that any particular arrangement or payment that is made that could be violative of STAR for any kickback, that it is made in furtherance of the triple aims of the ACO, um, increased care, better quality, lower costs. And then it is um, documented and there are certain publication requirements and there are still publication requirements and other documentation requirements that have to be um, abided by. And it appears we may be having some technical difficulties with the slides, and so we are advancing uh, them as well. So uh, to the extent we uh, don't have those up, well, obviously these will be materials that we can discuss later. Right. These, they should, we are on the ACO waiver slide now, so hopefully you see that. Um, we are, then we'll look at also the shared savings distribution waiver. The payments that are made, um, and I'll go back to the, uh, I hate to do this if we can't. Um, the payments that are made from CMS to the ACO can then be distri distributed. So those payments are shared savings payments. Those payments can then be distributed to different participants or preferred providers within the ACO arrangement. That is a, there's a particular waiver, a particular ability to be able to do that under uh, this, the shared savings distributions waiver. Uh, the most challenging part of the waivers is to really ensure that there's an understanding of what payments are being made, to whom and for what, uh, and then making the determination of, okay, does this payment really qualify for a traditional Stark anti-kickback exception? Do we really need to utilize the waiver? To the greatest extent possible, we try to make sure that the arrangements just comply with traditional Stark and any kickback arrangement. Uh, and also, if you have trouble seeing the slides, you can open the PDF on your handout and follow along. We're on the ACO waivers uh, slide. To the extent that to the extent that you cannot 
comply with one of the stark and any kickback exceptions or safe harbors, then look to the waivers. I think if you really can, at, at the point, again, we're always looking towards um, an enforcement action. If at some point you do have an enforcement action, you want to be able to show, look, whenever we could, we maintain compliance with the Stark and anti-kickback exceptions and safe harbors. We wanted to make sure that we could, we did where we could. But in those instances where we were doing something a little more innovative, we were doing um, an arrangement a little more, a little different from the traditional model, then we utilized the waiver. We did an assessment. We ensured that it was um, necessary and would, would at least had a chance of resulting in meeting the triple aims so that you really have a good documentary basis for not only the implementation of it, but also the review and other compliance quality checks on those things. Uh, some of the other innovation models, uh, episode-based payment incentive initiatives, primary care transformation. Uh, we really have seen that the method by which individuals are paid has changed, and this has changed what the structural models are. So when you are looking at um, a certain episode-based payment and the different providers that are involved in that, you really want to take a good look at how those particular providers are being compensated. And not only does it make sense from a clinical perspective, is it um, financially fair for those individuals who are involved? Because we know if we don't have providers that feel that they're fairly treated, um, we won't have providers. <laughs> so at our location, they will go somewhere where they will be. And really having that balance between fair compensation for those individuals that's compliant with um, whatever fair market value is for that area, as well as contemplating incentive arrangements where appropriate that really will still fit within a particular episode-based payment is key. Primary care transformation, we've seen a number of acquisitions of primary care companies and those who are uh, traditional urgent care are now owned by a hospital system, or a hospital system is opening up a number of urgent care models within the area. Um, as those relationships are forming, we always want to keep in mind uh, patient choice, and although, that, although we are letting them know about the relationship and letting them know about the continuum of care that's offered, we never want to impinge on the patient's ability to choose. Uh, clinically integrated networks, we touched on that earlier. Uh, they are, this issue, uh, the FTC guidance related to clinically integrated networks and uh, to ensure exemption from or compliance with the antitrust rules and what's expected. And it really comes down to the infrastructure and whether there is true uh, relationship, there's true, there are true efficiency objectives you have things built around those efficiency objectives, and it's funded that there, there's really money to make this work, um, and there are people to make this work. So it's not just monetary, but human. If you have a certain account where these funds are, that's fine, but if you don't have the people that there to make it work, it really won't look like you're trying to form a clinically integrated network. Uh, here is just an overview of the issues related to clinical integration. Some of these are maintained within uh, one health system. Some health systems have their own health plan and they're able to really pull this together under one, one house, but uh, others are forming relationships to put these four quadrants together. Narrow networks, we're all aware of a number of... Hey, can you just go back first on your, on your chart? On the clinical and on the CINs, are these basically representative of all the types of systems that or types of services that you're seeing to really have an integrated network, or is there one thing that's more important than the other? Well, you really have to have all of these um, elements, these the four elements in the center working together, because if you can't keep track of the patient 
and know where they are with regard to certain locations. And you can't, uh, you don't know where the patient is, whether in the hospital or the physician office, then it's difficult to dictate what the reimbursement is from the health plan perspective. What is happening when the health plan gets these claims? If, if, you do, if the health plan isn't any of this activity, that's ha anything that's happening with the patient until they just start getting these reimbursement claims, then you don't have that the communication that's necessary to ensure that that person's care is actually managed and coordinated in some way. It's just at the it's at whatever access point the patient may choose at a given time. Now on the CINs, are these just contractual agreements, or just it's unlike an ACO that there's some sort of corporate entity? Is that correct? Well, an ACO can be a CIN. So <laughs> uh, we love our acronyms, right? Um, but uh, the clinical integration piece, you know, we, it depends on how and what parties are involved in the ACO and how much of the market that ACO has taken up in the primary care or any particular area. But if they have triggered that uh, percentage where they are subject to antitrust enforcement, then they really have to be able to show that they are clinically integrated. So just because you're an ACO doesn't mean that you are checkbox, okay, well, I'm okay with any trust rules. You have to make sure that you're really um, taking the steps to be clinically integrated, especially if you're taking over a good part, portion of the market. And have you, been, have you seen any antitrust enforcement activity on the ACOs and CINs, at least recently? No, and what we... I spoke with the FTC last week. They have not. They have not moved forward with enforcement in this area yet. They said um, two and two ACOs have come to them to get approval to actually have it reviewed. It is not required, but you are permitted under the rules to get FTC to look at your arrangement. Um, and they have not um, had any adverse rulings about ACOs today. Are they going to be publishing those? analyses for the future of uh, the providers to they, consider? They have not. He was looking at their internal internal um, information. And I would think you know, there are some things that you can look to from other ACOs, but really of the ones that I've seen, some of them are they're so unique in the way that uh, different hospitals use them uh, that it really is a case-by-case -case analysis. And then if you want to touch on, and we've talked about some of the tools and techniques for compliance, uh, some of the challenges that uh, independent entities face because they don't have the same type of uh, relationships that others do and the same type of infrastructure. But if you could kind right. of touch on those issues. Well, so the enforcement players are... Uh, pretty much the same entities that I think most people are familiar with, especially on the federal side. When you have civil and criminal divisions of the Department of Justice, I think more importantly, regardless of your clinical model or your attempts to integrate under the Affordable Care Act or otherwise, the Department of Justice is increasingly seeking to bring corporate criminal cases and are actively eval evaluating uh, whistleblower suits for those as well, but also with the Yates Memorandum that was announced probably several months ago by the uh, Deputy Attorney General, where they're really focusing on criminal enforcement of individuals, so your executive level officers, and really trying to make an example of those individuals, which I think that memorandum is a direct outgrowth of the courts as well as the public's perception that individuals were not held accountable criminally during the financial meltdown. And so they're trying to not only use this in the securities and the financial world, but also increasingly in the health care. Uh, is that something new? No, but it is, again, a renewed enforcement that I think if you're an executive or you're an owner of a health care company, it's something to be cognizant of. Uh, and again, I'm not going to go through all the agencies here, but you know, one of the uh, one thing to also to consider is that for those organizations that may or may not take a large percentage of federal funds, it's almost impossible to segregate federal funds from commercial funds, and especially with the 
exchanges and the subsidies, those are deemed federal funds for purposes of law enforcement, under the, especially under the Federal False Claims Act, which we're not really going to discuss here today. Just know that that's the primary tool in which the government collects the tens of millions and billions of dollars from healthcare providers. So let's flip to the next slide if we can. And again, the criminal statutes, and the purpose here is that even though there may be uh, certain waivers associated with the formation of ACOs or CINs or other collaborative models, it's important to realize that there are no criminal exemptions. So, you know, although you can paper up a transaction or an arrangement and seek to comply uh, and compensate physicians under some sort of quality indicators or benchmarks, um, if you do run afoul with the criminal intent, you know, there is no waiver and you still can't get prosecuted uh, for particularly egregious crimes. Now, these are criminal statutes and these are the variety of them that are typically used by the Department of Justice and most states have analogs as well. In Texas, for instance, there's a state version of the anti-kickback statute uh, and kind of a mini Stark as well. And then there are obviously disclosure requirements. Failure to comply with the safe harbors on a federal level is to be failure to comply with the state laws, and I think that's pretty common. So what I would caution you and your clients and your organizations from doing is just assuming because you are attempting to form an ACO or some sort of integrated model to, you know, not and to freely throw around the R word, which is, you know, worse than the F word fraud in this case, but referrals. How can I pay my physicians to make referrals. I mean, I still think, although there is some tension under the Affordable Care Act, you still have to be cognizant that those criminal statutes are out there, both state and federal. And then, again, I just listed them. And increasingly, regardless of uh, ACO or otherwise, that CMS has increased and stepped up its enforcement uh, due to new authorities under the Affordable Care Act for suspension and revocations from Medicare at the same time as an enforcement action that seems to be the new playbook and the remedies and the due process associated with them are, are relatively limited. Uh, so again, credible allegations of fraud are just simply that, you know, one claim, two claims can't constitute a credible allegation. Uh, just briefly, because I know we're running down in time, uh, the anti-kickback statute a criminal statute and there are state analogs as well. And, and just being, cognizant of the fact that this talks about remuneration while there are safe harbors, really any time you're recommending or arranging for an item or service under a federal program, uh, it can implicate this if done with the right or the incorrect knowledge. And obviously compliance with the safe harbors means less risk. Just because you're outside the safe harbors does not necessarily mean uh, you violated the statute, but it is indicia of it. And I have here something, the one purpose test, and that's something that's become more and more critical, especially under the Department of Justice and the OIG's increasing kind of prosecutions to pursue individual medical directors, et cetera, that if any purpose of the arrangement or the remuneration is deemed to have be to induce referrals, therefore, so if the remuneration, one purpose of the remuneration is to increase or induce referrals, then you violated the one purpose test. To me, this makes all the exceptions under the Stark Law, as well as the kickback safe harbor, kind of superfluous. And so, well, I don't. There hasn't been a lot of litigation on this, but I do see DOJ and OIG, especially in some of the clients I've had and, and been in front of, articulating this position. And and I'll, I wait to see how how it really actually plays out. And again, there's a tremendous amount on the next slide. A tremendous amount of AKS safe harbors. Every year there's an annual solicitation for new preambles and comments on uh, proposed safe harbors. And increasingly, in the last years, I think are going to be very technical based, uh, especially when you're talking about IT infrastructure, uh, any EMR, because most of the safe harbors that have been in play for 10, 15 years are pretty well established. And again, just generally speaking, the safe harbors in writing for at least a year value or volume does not, you know, the fair market value can, is set forth in advance, arm's length transaction, is it commercially reasonable, and the compensation really can't fluctuate, take into account value or volume of referrals. And again, the anti-kickback statute only addresses 
federal health care program, so if there's a federal nexus, be it a state program or otherwise, you run afoul potentially of the anti-kickback statute. And again, I would caution those individuals, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and TRICARE are the big ones, but there are other payers as well. And then on the next slide, we talk about the ACA, which was you know, enacted almost five years ago, almost six years ago now, uh, and it amended the anti-kickback statute and, and kind of reformed the definition uh, to eliminate a decision out of the western part of the United States. But basically, you still have to have specific intent to, to violate the statute. You just don't have to have the specific intent to violate the anti-kickback statute. And again, violations of the statute can result in False Claims Act violations as well. Uh, and one of the key things here under the Affordable Care Act, especially when we're talking in the criminal context, is that it clarified the guidelines to the extent that the presumption of loss which in criminal cases drives the incarceration period, uh, is the billed amount, not the paid amount. And there's ways to get around that, but ultimately if you're billing $10,000 for a service and you have an expectation of $1,000 or you believe you're getting $1,000, the government will argue that the $10,000 is the loss, not the $1,000. All right. Some compliance tips here as we wind down here. Now, the compliance officer plays a, a key and critical role in oversight for the organization. I mean, again, you have, these are essentially the seven elements here. Uh, open communications refers to the hotline, et cetera. But the, one of the most important things that you want to do is that, you know, number seven, that you enforce violations. So if there are problems, you are taking those corrective and remedial steps in order to ensure that individuals are being held accountable, whether they're the CEO, CFO, all the way down to the nursing or the uh, allied health staff, and especially physicians. If physicians are violating the rules and policies of the organization, it's important that they're being held accountable. Uh, and part of the audit function, really, in my opinion, equals repayment, because nobody can get it right 100% of the time. And now under the Affordable Care Act and some of its uh, predecessor amendments to the False Claims Act, a known material overpayment that has failed to be repaid within 60 days, especially if we're talking federal funds, uh, can constitute an explicit violation of the False Claims Act. And there's whole theories and there's whole seminars on how you go about doing that. Just know that if you've got a problem, you've got to do the internal investigation and make the repayment within 60 days. All right, the next step as we're winding down here, compliance tips. Generally, there's three lines, and I don't have ownership over this, but I have heard it articulated this way. The bulk of your compliance activity is going to be your business and your compliance, your operational people. I mean, management has to be held accountable and identify those problems. So essentially, your operational people really are your unofficial compliance people. The next step, which obviously is less uh, pervasive but necessary as well as your compliance and risk and your risk management and your quality assurance people, they also need to be working with the operations and embedded in you know, that lower layer of the pyramid in order to ensure that your organization is getting the kind of the most bang for its buck from a compliance perspective. And then obviously when necessary, independent oversight external auditors, external counsel, uh, or in some cases the government is going to come in and evaluate your compliance organization and program as well. And so just finally on the next slide, Kenya, uh, these are some, some general compliance tips. And again, that these are questions that you want to ask yourself to ensure that you are being an effective compliance program. So when you turn it back into the Affordable Care Act and new, some of the new collaborative models, I think it's important to establish and reinvigorate your compliance approach to make sure that you now have new contracts, you now have new relationships, you now have arrangements that maybe your organization really is not familiar with or don't really know how they're going to play out. And so these types of questions that really need to be used and addressed, especially when you're talking about the board level organizations or your upper management. And then finally, uh, Kenya, if we go to the last one slide here, uh, 
you know, you want to be assured that when an individual comes to your organization, you know, they're treated obviously with the respect and the candor they need and the discretion, but you want to make sure that, you know, anything you do is documented and you take it seriously. Because oftentimes when I was 10 years as an AUSA uh, here in North Texas, I saw hundreds and hundreds of whistleblower cases and the vast majority of them, but for an, a, a one or two, were really individuals who felt that their complaints fell on deaf ears, that they made a valid complaint and it wasn't addressed by the organization. And that failure to address or respond to that individual, whether writing or otherwise, really led to a lot of needless filings of key TAMs and a lot of resources to defend a subpoena or an ensuing investigation. Oftentimes, uh, those individuals may have also an attendant employment arrangement issue and they'll go see a lawyer and the lawyer will tell them, well, did you ever complain or were you retaliated against? And bingo, then next thing you know, you have a key TAM filed uh, under seal uh, and your organization is under investigation by the Department of Justice or whatever state attorney general you happen to be located in. Well, and the one that we work on specifically, one of those, uh, not only were we dealing with the investigation with you, with DOJ, um, and whatever federal lawsuits were filed and the investigation and all of that, the plaintiff's counsel also filed a case in state court, which they were trying to get certain documents to use the documents from the state court litigation to bolster their investigation and, and the and the federal case. Right. The investigation today, increasingly you'll see, uh, even in declined whistleblower suits, the relators or the plaintiffs going forward and using all sorts of creative means in order to obtain information to address the case and, uh, and, and bolster the evidence. So, uh, and I guess the last two slides really are just a self-assessment. And those are questions that you can ask yourself in the organization, and I think they're self-explanatory. But one thing to consider that, you know, those questions I used to ask organizations, you know, while their CEO or CFO were under oath, and it's always embarrassing if your board or some high-level executive doesn't even know the name of the compliance officer. So I think at some point uh, it behooves everyone to really go through that list <laughs> and ensure that their organization can at least answer those questions. So with that, I think we're going to wrap up. Our contact information is at the end, and we're more than happy to take questions or respond to any emails or any issues that come up. Uh, Kenya, thank you so much for the informative presentation, and thank you uh, all for listening and being available today to hear what we have to say about ACOs and compliance. No, thank you. Jill? Well, Kenya and Sean, thank you so much. I do apologize. Um, there were some audio and uh, video issues uh, coming from the connection. However, I do think that we have the entire thing recorded and we will give that to the audience. If you have specific questions, I know some people have typed them in, I would go ahead and email them um, or their phone numbers are there on the screen. Um, I have shared the PDF on my screen so that uh, you could see the slides as they were talking. And um, again, thank you so much. Uh, if you would like to contact us at firsthcc.com or request a demo, please email us at info at 1sthcc.com. Uh, you can call at 888-543-4778. And again, any questions that you forward to us, we will forward on to uh, Kenya and Sean. Uh, or you can email or call them directly. Thank you so much and have a great day.